What happened that day when you got blown up? We went out on this big old called Panther's Claw, our chain of command was like, you need to go down this road and clear this road. And I was like, this is just gonna go wrong. My chain of command mate got a lot, to, a lot of blood on the hands. And literally 20 minutes later, bang. ID mate, straight under my vehicle. In the seat, I was still in the seat. I couldn't feel my legs, I couldn't breathe. I was raging mate, I was like raging. I was like, I can't believe I'm dying here. Dunk, welcome to the show, mate. Hello, how are you doing? Very good, very good. Very much looking forward to this one. Let's roll the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you become an <laughs> RAF legend? Legends. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I I grew up in the Highlands of Scotland, um, up in a place called Muravord, which is, you know, where the Daywalkers are, mate. It's like proper up north, mm. um, sort of north of Inverness. And, uh, yeah, typical sort of, Childhood, really, growing up in the eighties, mate. Was school of hard knocks, wasn't it? <laughs> Absolutely, um, in a good way. And then um, left school quite early on, fifteen and a half. Um, left to be uh, an apprentice gamekeeper, deer stalker. Um, a deer stalker. Yeah, mate. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, in the Highlands, mate. What's great. a deer stalker? Yeah. So, as a trainee, you you essentially, mate, you're the the youngest sort of. Uh, shit job squad mate yeah. on, on an estate so you've got like well we had on our estate and anyway, we had the head keeper the underkeeper and then me as a trainee yeah and we were on like a hundred thirty thousand acre uh, red deer estate wow. up in the up in up in the highlands and um so you do a tiny amount at college but uh you you live and work on a on an estate learning the ropes you know how to stalk deer how to it's everything with estate management you know it's how okay how, how to look after the place and and a lot of it as well is how to keep it running. So mm. bringing in clients for deer stalking, you know, richer the better, the more money they spend, the better. Yeah. Um, we had grouse as well. So you do a lot of a, a lot of the sort of um, the care of a state, trying to, to breed the grouse and, and, and getting them into good numbers for shoot days and stuff. And So deer stalking is all about shoot days, is it? Yeah. So like a lot of it is that you've got a lot of deer on the estate, yeah. but clearly they roam all over the Too many the deer. Um, the idea is, mate, you try and thin the herd, so you, okay. you want ideally the best, the best animals to, to keep breeding, so that the, the the sort of herd gets bigger and better and stronger. So you're trying to cull the ones that are that are weak and slow, and and they're not going to make winter and stuff like that. Oh. So, um, and then some clients you'll get like you know super rich clients coming that pay a lot of money to to come and stock like a big stag. You know, so bigger the the sort of fancier the, the the antlers, the head, the better the better the stock as well. The harder it is, the more they want to they do it. You know, it's great sort of bragging rights. They go back to the states or whatever, and say, oh, so I'm stalking for days yeah. for this like stag and and all the rest of it. So I was doing that, and uh, I just I just like being outside, mate. Yeah, I just like being outside, and uh, probably. S- sounds a bit wet mate but i couldn't wait to get out of school yeah. i was like i really sort of i bullied mate in mm. school you just were was, bullied were you? yeah mate yeah just okay. a big tall kid yeah skinny big ears yeah. just mate just a bully's dream yeah. and i was just no confidence just wanted to get out of school and that for me being outside and just doing stuff learning and it um game keeping and that is quite a traditional job yeah. in scotland um there's not many jobs about it's usually like a father and son gets passed yeah. down kind of job you know yeah. rather than new boys coming in yeah. so the actual permanent jobs are pretty scarce so i was getting to that age where i was like i, I can't really sort of keep doing this i'm not going to get a job probably and uh, the, the head keeper that i was working for he was like mate you need to get out of here go and do stuff go and have an adventure go and you know, join up, join the military, go and yeah. do something. And that was my sort of first thought of, yeah, I'll go and join up. And I went to the careers office, mate, in, in Inverness. That was the, the the local careers office. And Inverness, for people who are listening out there, how north of Edinburgh that is? How many how many miles oh, is it north it's, of Edinburgh? It's, it's north, north, mate. It's, it's a good it's couple prop- of hundred miles, mate. Yeah, it? it's, yeah, yeah. So, so the middle of nowhere, basically. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like <laughs> right up, mate. So it's about a hundred ish miles to the top of Scotland from Inverness. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's it's right up there, mate. Wow. When men are men and sheep are scared, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a rumbled <laughs> station, mate. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, so I went to uh, the careers office, and yeah. what I would say is that. It, this is before the internet, right? Mm. So, what roughly what year are we talking now? Yeah, like ninety seven. Okay. Um, so you got the careers office, mate, and all you've got is what we're doing now is interaction, yeah. right? So you go in and you've got like a representative from uh, there's a guy from like the local army regiment, a guy from the navy, and a guy from the RAF. You go in and like at the time, I quite an impatient person, right? I just wanted, I just thought it was like you sign up. And you go wallop, where you see you later, yeah, bye. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, that's fine. I just want to go, <laughs> and uh, it just isn't like that. So the, the 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 guy from the from the army, he was like, uh, yeah, we've got a recruiting sort of like it's slowed down at the minute, so you won't be going anywhere for at least six months. It's not going to happen. And I was like, well, it's not good for me that I just want to go now. And uh, navy, I'd, I wasn't really keen on the on the navy. Spoke to the the RAF guy and he was like, well, "What is it you wanting to do?" And I was like, "Well, just uh, I I want to do something interesting, really." And uh, I left school with not many qualifications, mm -hmm. mate. And uh, he was like, "Well, come and do the aptitude test." Did the aptitude test, and he was like, "Have you heard of the RAF regiment?" And I was like, "No, what's what's that?" Mm -hmm. Watched the recruiting video, and I was like, "Yeah, it looks all right. That's fine." And he was like, "Well, if you sign up, you you'll be gone now." Like. In a month's time, and I was like, "Yeah, done. Go, let's go." <laughs> and it's like, "All right, okay, fine." <laughs> so I, I joined the RAF regiment and um, literally went from Inverness, mate, down to London on the train. And it was like, uh, that was I had a, that no shock for you, wasn't mate. it? It was like <laughs> Eddie Murphy coming to America, mate. I was like, "What the? <laughs> fuck is yeah. it? what is this place like?" And you get print back in the day; it was all printed directions. Yeah. Go to this station, go here, go there, mm. and I was just like. I don't know what the hell's going on yeah. here. Eventually got to uh, the fact that one of my best mates, I bumped into him on the way down. And I said, I oh, don't suppose you're joining up here, mate? And he was like, yeah. I was like, all right, cool. So we just like got lost together. <laughs> and we ended up at this place, this station where this guy just shouting and bawling at us. And we're like, I think we're in the right place. We're in the right place. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then that was it. We um, yeah joined up basic training and then... Wait How old were you when you joined in the RAF? Ju just turned 19. Just turned like 19. Just, yeah, yeah. So young, I suppose. And how would you yeah. explain the RAF for someone listening here? Me, I cop a bit of flack, mate, mm. um, for, for me even mentioning the RAF regiment, which I, I get. But um, the, so the RAF is clearly it's all to do with aircraft isn't yeah. it everyone knows that but the RF regiment is I, I suppose people are going to have different opinions with it but the idea being that it it's the sort of um the security side of the RAF right that's what it, what it's supposed to be so whether people like this or not it, it doesn't really matter but it's you are infantry trained you work at the same doctrine as the British army whether they like it or not um but the focus being on on airfields, right? And probably sounds a bit boring, mate, right? And it is now. But that for me was a stepping stone to getting in the military, yeah. to having an adventure. And yeah. so I don't really care what other people's opinions are, you know. And my only thing about my regiment is it's no different to anyone else's regiment. You speak to anyone for the guys you've had on the podcast yeah. and stuff. They're proud of what, they've done their regiment, their blokes, right? And that's all I would say. I'm no different. And people probably want to take the piss out of my regiment. That's fine. I don't care. Just don't do but it But who you say face. people want to take the piss out of the regiment? <clears throat> Your normal bod on the street, especially myself, would go, Army, Navy, RAF, all legends, fantastic, well done. Leda. Is it only in between those three they're all sort of looking at each other going, you're not as good as us, we're yeah, better than you? Yeah, of course it is, mate. Okay. Yeah, so you got like the sort of cat badge banter, mate. Yeah. You know, you're always going to have it. You're not as good as me because we do this or we do that or we do the next thing. And, you know, I know we're going to come on to it. But mm. that changed later on, mm. mate, you know, when when you're in a big melting pot of blokes, it, it changes. It, I think... As long as you hold yourself and your blokes accountable to the highest possible standard that you can, mm. 
but so you can do right other people's opinions will be what they are i don't really care about yeah. that to be honest i think what matters is what you what the results you produce on operations and how you conduct yourself and i'm not responsible for anyone else i'm only responsible for me and my blokes that is it yeah okay um and but it doesn't, I, it doesn't I, matter what what badge you're wearing not to me but no. then that's probably easy for me to say when you've got guys out there that really hold that stuff dear to to them mm. that think they're the absolute dogs bollocks yeah, okay. mate. and I'm, who, who am i to judge you yeah. know i to yeah you know, but i don't really judge other people mate yeah. so I don't, I don't when was your when you were in when you were in the island you signed up and whatever how long were you in there before before you went on your first tour so so i so i got to my first unit in 98 and th so all this is way before like 9 11 yeah. right and me I, it we were living the dream in the military back then without realizing it you had um i got to my first unit and it was like you going skiing in bavaria for like 10 days and we're like what and they're like yeah and we're going to give you x amount of money a day to spend on beer and you're like <laughs> Oh, I've done it. I've win, made win, it. Win. I've made it. I've done it. And I, I can't ski. And like, yeah. don't worry about don't it. Worry. And I'm like, okay. And it, it, we're living the dream. So mm. the, the the tours back then was sort of Northern Ireland was kind of closing to what it is now. It was mm. sort of on the drawdown. And we used to do like this, like really like noddy crap, easy tour out in Kuwait, which was like six months just guarding the, tornado force which was looking into iraq at the at the border yeah six months at this airfield in the middle of nowhere all you did was get a suntan and do fizz so you yeah. came back off si six months really fit um, and like really tanned yeah. and saved loads of money and it was yeah, it was no risk yeah okay there, there was no chance of anything happening mate no chance um and roughly how many men would be there so we would usually def deploys a, f a flight so yeah. a flight is the equivalent to um to a, a company so about just over a no, hang on i'm getting that wrong a well so a platoon is about 28 guys yeah yeah no that's, that's about right yeah okay. so there'd be a hundred and odd blokes a whole okay. squadron would deploy usually or a flight sometimes it just depends on what yeah what was happening and you then. knew you were there you knew you were totally safe you're like this is a good number Mate, we so you'd have the camp right yeah. And uh, you'd have the tornadoes on the camp. You'd do site security, and then you'd go off camp and you'd drive these old clapped out Land Rovers that had been left over from the Gulf War yeah. in '91, just absolute sheds. Mm. And you'd drive around just making sure that no goat herders are doing anything untoward or or whatever. It was just it it wasn't like obviously the focus. Everything changed after 9/11, yeah. didn't it? So the stuff we did then was just. It was all right, mate. It was yeah. just a bit boring. And that's when I kind of got bored. I, I am, like I said, I'm impatient, mate. Yeah. So I got bored really quickly. And I was like, right, I need to change what I'm doing here. This is this is boring. Mm. I need to change. Um, so I started training for um, for pre-para. So the Army do P Company. Royal Marines do the commando course, which then qualifies them if they want to go and do the jumps course, get the wings. Yeah. And the, the RAF or RF regiment do uh, pre-para. So you do like an arduous course that then qualifies you in theory to, to work with airborne forces and all the rest of it. And at the time there was a job going for, so I was like a, the equivalent of a, a private soldier, like an SAC sen senior aircraftsman. Um, and I was like, I'm bored. I need to go and do something like, you know. I, and so I went and did pre-para past that. And I managed to get on the, uh, this this sort of four man team called Attack P, which is a tactical air control party. So you might, uh, you, you know, if you speak to guys that are JTACs now, that you know, calling aircraft yeah. and all the rest of it, that was kind of the the beginning. Was a four man team. You had a sergeant and officer. They would do all the calling in of aircraft and and sort of bombing and and all the rest of it. And then you had two privates like me and my mate on the team and we do all the driving all the stuff with the radios and all that kind of stuff but we got attached to 16 brigade uh, 16 air assault and it was just in time for for the the gulf war in 2003 so we deployed with uh with one para we we went with the, the first battalion the parachute regiment as their attack p as their four man wow. four air controlling team and we 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 did that um which was yeah it was 
been interesting to me. It's great. You know, mm. it's, uh, like it seemed great. I was in. So, yeah. You know, but it, it what was, was that good. feeling like flying in in 2003? Mate, it's a photograph of me. I got one of the lads on the Chinook to photograph and we were, um, we just bundled into the Chinook and uh, we flew over the border and like you can, it was daylight as well. You could see the border and you could just see the US Marines had just basically punched in and just, they were going one way and the Brits focus was on Basra that, or the outlying bits of Basra to begin with. And we went in and it was just like the most excited, it's probably bad to say that. Mm. I, don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to come across as a madman, mate, mm. but it was just exciting. Like, I think you join the military for a certain expectation of something, right? And, and I think obviously there's extremes, but I, I loved it, mate. I just thought it was great. It was brilliant. You know, you're experiencing things and seeing things and being part of things that you just, you're not going to see it unless you put yourself up for it, mm. uh, unless you push yourself out there and go and do it and volunteer and all the rest of it. And I loved it. It was great. Mm. And we ended up working with all sorts of units out there. We were kind of like, uh, so we deployed in the end in like a Land Rover and a Pinsgower, which is like a sort of four by four kind of, truck and um you just literally get a call over the over the radio just like turn up at this grid this location on this day you're now supporting this unit to do this and that unit to do that and then you know one minute you'd be with the u.s marines the next minute you'd be with one power the next minute you'd be with seven yeah. armored brigade the next year it was, mate, it was mm. brilliant just rocking around so you went from boredom to extreme yeah, so we've got each day different something different yeah wow it's like 20 in my early 20s yeah, but perfect. I was like this is great yeah, this is brilliant um, was there any moment in that time when, on your first tour where you thought your life could come under threat? Um, we, mate, the, where we were, we so we did a lot of OPs, a lot of sort of push into an area. What's OP? We, uh, an observation post. So you'd go into like a location, observe it for, for a while. Um, and the idea being that we're, we, we were really trying to spot like all the armoured elements, all the tanks and all the rest of it, because they seemingly from the intelligence, they dug in a, a lot of the stuff waiting because they knew that we were coming. Yeah. So we're just expecting an all out, just, you know, all out war kind of thing, yeah. but it didn't really turn out like that, did it? It was just basically, we just stormed in. and But so we did a lot of sitting around watching um, and all the aircraft that normally that we would, put in to, to use for, for for dropping bombs and all the rest of it. We couldn't get I couldn't get them. They were all up north in Baghdad, you know, smashing smashing up north. So we ended up doing sort of more with artillery really. So you know it, it makes no difference. You can call in an arty strike is is fine on on sort of dug in tanks and all the rest yeah. of it. So it was fine. We got a little bit of this and that, but nothing not really. Mm -hmm. And I think it gives you a false sense of security, doesn't it? If you sort of think like nothing's really going on, it's yeah. all right. It's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. So, and it was over before it began as yeah. well. You know, we as a as a tack P, you don't. There's no peacetime job for that. It's you're dropping bombs. You're not. Yeah. You can't do that in peacetime. So once you once the fighting's over, it's like, well, what do we do now? Yeah. Nothing. So we sat around afterward. Um, came back to Colchester, had leave. And then uh, I got I went on a promotion course and got promoted. So yeah, that was about it, mate. Really. And then when you come back to culture, so how long till you went back? What was your next tour after that? Um, had a had a break, got promoted. Um, I ended up moving from Colchester to to another unit, which was really I was I was a I was about there, mate, to sign off. I was about to bin it. It was. Yeah, were you about me, to leave? Were you? Yeah, mate. Were yeah, you? it was just. Yeah, it wasn't. Why? It was shit, mate. It was just. It was In another unit working with another army unit. It's okay. probably not right that I slag the unit off. It's yeah. not really fair, but yeah. mate, it it just wasn't good for me. Um, In what way? Mentally. Yeah, yeah. So I come from like an exciting background where, you know, it, the expectation is to be fit and capable at your job, right? It's just the expectation. Um, went to this unit and uh, it was the complete reverse of that. And I was like, what the fucking hell? Yeah. You know, I got bollocked, mate. Yeah. I remember getting bollocked <laughs> because uh, we're on a parade and uh, the two I see of the squadron, 
bollocked me because he was like, you do too much fizz, you do too much exercise. And I was like, can you do too much too exercise? Much, yeah. And he was like, well, yeah, you can. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's why you're not at the front of the fizz, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it's just shit. Yeah. And I was just like, this is crap. I've got to get off this unit. And uh, by pure luck, that's when the rumblings, the offer, we'd heard nothing official really came out about it, but they were looking for volunteers to to go to the the SF support group. They were starting up in, in, in this time, this special forces support group. Mm. And I'd been to our admin chain, the RAF admin chain, and asked about it and asked about it. <clears throat> there was nothing. They weren't coming out with any information. And uh, by by again by pure luck, mate, I uh, bumped into this officer who was he was going to be the platoon commander of the RAF regiment lot that were going down to the SF support group. And he said, "Yeah, I was surprised not to see your name on it. I thought you'd have volunteered." And I said, "Well, I can't find any information." He was like, "Do you want to do it?" I'm like, "Yeah, too right to do." And he was like, "Right, great. I'll I'll put you down for it." I went, "All right, cool." And uh, yeah, I was picked as one of the the sort of first corporals, first section commanders to go down and sort of t- take part in that. Wow. Yeah. It was good, mate. Yeah, pure I luck. I bet. Yeah. yeah. What was your movements after there then? Where was your next tour after that? I was lucky that you got Special Forces support group. That probably opened up a whole new world to you. Different Good world, blokes. Mate. Yeah. Is a different type of bloke in there? Yeah. So you've had Radders on, haven't you? you yeah. Had, yeah. Dave so, so, yeah. So he was... God, he's got a story. He's a boy, isn't he? Yeah, he's a rum old I like boy, him mate. a lot. He's a... Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, salt of the earth. Yeah, um, he was. I wouldn't want to cross him. Yeah, he's a big boy, isn't he? Jeez. He's like an upside down Dorito, mate. Isn't he? <laughs> he's he's Dorito. massive, <laughs> mate. From a distance, you know, like he's doing it. Big unit. Yeah, yeah. Um, he um. So they. So his a background. Um, do you me explain about this? Yeah, mate. Yeah, right. right okay. It. So yeah. it got to the point where th- this is how I remember it, and I'm sorry if I've mm. got it wrong, but this is um. So. You had three para battalions, right? One, two, and three para. They got to the point where they were going to bin one of the battalions and one para was apparently going to be the one for the chop. They were going to get rid of it to save money and all the rest of it. But at the time, you had, obviously, you've got Afghan and Iraq going on like at the same time, and you've got other stuff as well. So like the SF, you know, you've got SB, SRR, and you've got- What's uh, SRR? A special reconnaissance regiment. Okay. So you've got like, or well, you got SAS and yeah. you got two two. So, yeah. Um, you so got SAS, SBS, and then SRR. SRR. Okay. So they're busy in in all these different yeah. theaters doing what they do, uh, like a super high level. But they were st- stretched, right? The stuff that they could do with not doing. Yeah, they okay. just need blocks and routinely. I mean, they 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 get army. Uh, units and all the rest of it detached to them to do stuff but what they said was like right we've got an opportunity here we could re-roll the first battalion the parachute regiment into essentially what the 75th rangers is in america yeah and they said well we'll do that with a battalion but then we'll take a company 100 and odd blokes from the royal marines and to be blatantly honest mate and it's fine i'll t- i'll take this on the chin they said well we should make it tri service, really. We should have Army, Navy, and RAF. We, so, if we do that, they essentially open themselves up to tri service funded in a yeah. sense. So, they said, okay, let's see what the RAF regiment can provide. And um, typical RAF, mate, we never saw the opportunity. We just turned around and said, yeah, we can spare 30 blokes or 28 blokes and give a platoon. We should have done more if we, you know, yeah. in hindsight. But who not, makes those decisions to say we mate, should have done more? I don't know, mate. But they, don't know. they should be hauled across the coals for it, mate. Okay, fucking idiots. Yeah, who, who, you know, they they had a real opportunity to to put like a decent amount of blokes down there yeah. to to do it. But typical RAF, mate. Yeah, just risk averse yeah. in my eyes. But yeah. my that's my opinion. Yeah, mate, yeah. But, so. They were looking for volunteers for, from from our lot, and the, the idea being that you had to be para trained already because they they just didn't have the time and effort to for you to disappear for a couple of weeks to do yeah. jump scores. So ideally, you're already winged up. Mm. So we got a few guys together. Um, uh, Twenty, no, there was thirty guys initially, just in case guys got injured. We did like a 
like a beat up, went down to Dartmoor, the training area, did a few weeks down there, just getting to know each other and um, getting back to basic sort of tactics and, and all the rest of it. And then we turned up, mate, at, uh, at Dover and, uh, mate, you can imagine, right, just a battalion of parachute regiment and there's 30 blokes with blueberries turn up. Just the reception we got, <laughs> mate, was just like whoosh, strapping. Yeah. Here we go. This is going to be good. And um, in fairness, mate, after the first um, Red Avenger, it's called a big, massive exercise, they took over pretty like a lot of Brecon and training area mm. and we just hit it, everyone, the whole unit hit it. Um, we were there for like a month in in January. So, cool. uh, yeah, in great, Brecon. Mate. Yeah. Mm, winner. <laughs> you know, I was in the raft, mate. I don't do bad weather. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, you know. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so we went literally from basic like pairs, drills, all the way up to, to company level. And at the time, this was all brand new. So you had director special forces and his sort of group coming in and out just to check the standard of everything. Mm. And again, just sort of to give it a little bit of credibility, at the beginning, they went to each sort of unit. So obviously they know that P company for the power edge is, is fine. Yeah. It's an arduous course, that's fine. They clearly know that the, the all arms commando or the commando course is is, is what it is, yeah. arduous. But they came to our, our depot and they looked over our course and they were there for a few days to, to, to ensure that it was what we say it was. And it's all ratified anyway, mate, from, from the army uh, that, to, to make sure it is what it is mm. and uh, they were happy with it so in my eyes if they're happy that's fine yeah. we did that month in uh, in Brecon got the tick in the box that we were basically operational as a unit and because we were a fully manned platoon we uh, we rolled straight out the door to 2006 to support um, the SBS in Afghan did you? and it was it wasn't exciting yeah. it was before it kicked off in, in Afghan it was the sort of tail end it, it was the beginning, the beginning the very beginning it? Okay. and it was all the reconnaissance really okay. um, so all the TLZs all the tactical landing zones out in the middle of nowhere the SBS lads would fly in go and do a job come back we'd all jump on Herx, Hercules and get back out of there it was okay. it was nothing exciting um, sounds exciting <laughs> Mate, but for you, there's, there's <laughs> only so much boiling hot water you can drink. Yeah, like, all day. Do you know what I mean? You're just like, oh, this is good. Um, just some sand in that water, and um, it's like oh, shit. And um, and a lot of it was trust. Okay. You know, you turn up with a, a special forces unit. Mm. And you're not them, mate. You haven't gone through their selection yeah. process and all the rest. Of it. So there is a bit. Is there hierarchy there? Are they looking. They're not looking down's the wrong word. No. But is there a bit? Or you're yeah. looking up a bit at them. You look at them because they're special forces, mate. Yeah. Yeah. They're the creme de la creme. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, Jesus, they, they, they are what they are. They yeah. look different. Yeah. They, they look just great. Yeah. Not in a weird yeah, way, yeah, mate, yeah, but they yeah. just look the bollocks, mm. don't they? And you're like, oh, I'd like to be like that one mm. day. Um, and yeah, there is a lot of that. And then I guess from their side of it, they don't, they don't really know if they can trust you, do they? Yeah, okay. And that's fine. That's only something that time and sort of effort mm. can sort out. The more you do with them, the the more your sort of face fits the bill, the, the more they're like, oh, no, no, they're good lads, they're yeah. good lads. We'll show you what to do. Right, okay. And they give you a little bit more, a little bit more. Yeah. And then before you know it, you're doing like a lot more than you thought you'd be doing. Mm. And it is good. Mm. Um, but it, it's something only time can, can, can help. Mm. So we did 2006. That was a, that was all right. We came back and then the following year we we rolled out the door with um, a squadron to Baghdad. So Matt Matt Hellier, Matt Hellier, uh, not name dropping, I suppose. Yeah, but, no, Matt, he's, um, a, but, he's a great bloke. Yeah, lo lo lovely human mm. being, like, and um, the work he does with the Pilgrim Band, amazing. Yeah, yeah. And so but so we rolled out the door with their squadrons, so our our platoon, with a few extra blokes from the parachute regiment to make up. It's about forty of us, I think, mm. and. Uh, I went mean, out there as a corporal mate. Mm. I'm like, easy, it's a great job. Yeah. And uh, we were supporting those lads, you know, through their like sort of seven month tour, doing doing all sorts. Mm. Yeah, it's good, it's exciting. Where were you, where did you fly out to? Where were you, what was your tour in 2009? 
So when a, a company which is made up of three platoons goes on to the ops cycle, right? You either go to Iraq as a single platoon to support that, or you go out as the other two platoons to Afghan to do uh, to do a job out there. Mm. So we rolled out in 2009 to Afghan to a job called uh, Rigo. Uh, and um, that essentially was two platoons and we were we had our, our Afghans, uh, like our Afghan contingent. So we'd recruit, train and mentor the Afghans and then you'd take them on the ground. So you'd do everything with them. You'd work up uh, ops and, and, and sort of, um, different things that you might get from the battle group, or you do yourself. You roll out the door and uh, and 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 sort of do that. And that was a great job because you were a platoon on your own with your Afghans, completely self sufficient. You got out for six weeks at a time, just living off the wagons and doing strikes and doing sort of deliberate operations. It's brilliant, mate. You go down the south. Uh, to Baramcha, which is like right down the south of Helmand, and you'd basically work all the way up the green zone, just jumping in and jumping out, and uh, doing a lot of reconnaissance for the battle group because you go to areas. What where, do you mean by reconnaissance? So you go into to locations, you go into like places in the green zone that you go in and do a shura, right? So you'd go in with the intention purely of working out if it was friendly or not. So you'd basically on a traffic light system. You know, you'd either get in there and hold a Shura and be like, no, it's, it's yeah, okay, they're, they're open to a bit of something. Yeah. Or you wouldn't get near the place and okay. you, you just get hammered. Or you get in and you get ambushed on the way out. It just, right, it just okay. depends, mate. It was, every place was completely different. But you'd rock up at some places, you'd have a Shura you know, meeting with all the, the sort of heads in the village. And they think you're Russians, mate. They 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 hadn't seen any white eyes yeah. since the eighties, and they were like, "Yeah, the Russian, yeah, you're Russians." You explain to them through the Afghans that yeah. you're British, and they'd be like, "What what are you doing here? We beat you in the like a few hundred years ago. Why yeah. are you back?" Sort of thing. Is like, that right? like, okay. Yeah, they know the history. Like, yeah, yeah. You confuse them living in mud huts, mm. thinking, "Yeah, they don't know nothing," but yeah. they they know the mm. history. Like, they're really up on it. Um, so it was interesting, but. 2009, the the biggest threat out there, the the worst. I think it was the worst year for for IEDs. They just it was a continual game of cat and mouse all the time. The technology would change all the time. So low metal content, so you couldn't find IEDs, the pressure plates, and all the IED. rest of it with the balance uh, improvised explosive device. Mm. So you you just you couldn't find them. Or they'd confuse it by by putting shipyard confetti, you know, like bits of metal and stuff to confuse it, so you'd think there was something there. And then the psyops begins, mate, where they would put the pressure plate back a little bit, so you're full stride when you step on it and hits you between the legs, mate. And yeah, that's that's it. Good night. You're not you're not coming back with your uh, with your with your bits and bobs. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we lost a few boys to to IEDs, and the vehicles we were in were designed to be completely off road, right? Jackals. I don't know if you ever seen a jackal, mm. mate, but great bit of kit yeah. if you use it properly. Yeah. If you employ it properly, it's brilliant. Um, and the Afghans that we had are driving around in Ford Rangers, which I don't know if you know, they're not exactly bomb proof, yeah. mate. You know, so the idea being that you mitigate the threat of going over an IED. By don't go into locations really that you think they are. So you wouldn't go on a road, you wouldn't go on tracks, you just avoid it. In theory. But um we so halfway through the tour, we went out on this big op called Panther's Claw, which is a big battle group op into the green zone. And it was I mean, they they lost a lot of blokes on that op, the battle group. You know, they lost stacks of guys mate they just the place what they thought had happened was that the insurgents had walked the ground that they knew that we were coming but backward right and they're like right if we engage them here the blokes are going to get into cover over there right 
we will just litter that place with yeah. IEDs. Yeah. And then they just did that everywhere. Okay. And then they put like double stacked tank mines in the roads. And, you know, you, you do that in the winter time when it's wet, you can get them in. And then as the sun bakes the ground, as the mumps get out, it's rock hard. Yeah, okay. Mate. It's like concrete. How big? How big is a? How big is a bomb? What's the size of a bomb look like? It depends, mate. Because so sometimes they use the old Russian vehicle, like tank mines, which are big, and they put two on top. Yeah. Right, and then a small IED to detonate it. Yeah. And you go over that, and yeah, it's going to cause problems. But then they'd make uh, like sort of real rudimentary stuff, like homemade explosive HME. So they they'd make that. <clears throat> um themselves and they'd fill these containers uh like plastic containers and they'd bury them and then they uh, so the one that got me was a command wire so they they have a wire all the way back to a firing point and they just sit there and cover wait for a particular vehicle on a particular day to do it connect the battery bang and that's you like what happened that day when you got blown up so we we were right at the three month point and um we we pushed into the green zone as two platoons and we were sort of taking it in turns to go out in the ground. So one platoon would be back in the compound and then the next one would go out. And we, our platoon got, um, how to put it nicely, ta tasked with a job. And it wasn't a job that we should have been doing, mate. And I would say that because I got injured, but mm. the only vehicles moving around at that time in that area because they did so many casualties. Have you seen the Mastiffs? They're big, massive mm. armoured trucks, yep. mate. And even they were getting defeated by IEDs. But our chain of command and all the wisdom was like, right, you need to go down this road and clear this road. And I was a platoon sergeant at the time, mate, right? And like I said before, my, my loyalty and my sort of my focus was to the blokes, right? You, even my Afghans, and I, I do say that, my Afghans, mm. it breaks your heart when, when those guys get killed and injured, like, because they've been there fighting for years. We do six months and then go home. Yeah. So they're super invested. Um, and we'd lost a few guys up to that point, a few of the Afghans, and uh, you learn by mistakes. And I was like, this is going to go wrong. Did you, should... did you sense that, did you? Yeah, I w this probably sounds a bit airy fairy, right? But I woke up that morning and uh, we'd been tasked the night before. And me and my boss sat there and we worked out what we we're going to do and how we we're going to do it. And me and my boss were like, What are they doing? Why are they sending us out in light reconnaissance vehicles down a road that they know is littered with IEDs to clear it? And the thing with clearing any kind of route, it's only clear while you're clearing it. Mm. As soon as you take your eyes off that road, it's not clear again. So whoever's coming down the road has to clear it anyway. So it's almost a pointless task. Yeah. And it's not a task that, I'm not saying we were too good for it, but it's not a task generally that we would be doing. It, you know, that's really for a specialized unit to be doing that, like an EOD unit or sort of bomb disposal mm. or like the Americans had specialist vehicles that would go down and yeah. do seismic surveys and work out where stuff was. Same blokes down in the jackal that's going to like basically you know, disintegrate. So um, I had this feeling in my stomach, mate, and I just felt like today's the day. This is it now. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get it. I'm going to cop it. And um, my mate, we were sat having a brew early morning, having a bit of breakfast. And uh, I said to him, I goes, mate, I'm, I think today's the day. Like, and he was like, he was like, yeah, I know what you mean, mate. He goes, oh, I've got a bad feeling. And I was like, yeah, me too. You could put it down to nerves, mate. You could put it down to anything. You could put it down to stress. You know, my, my wife was pregnant at a time, so maybe I was thinking about that. I don't know. It could be anything. And uh, I felt, right, it was probably, I don't know, it's just one of those things you do. Like, before we left, I went to my chain of command. I won't say who or what, but like, I went to my chain of command. I was like, sir, we should not be doing this. We are going to, this is going to go wrong. And he turned around me and he goes, Son Slater, shut the fuck up. Get in your vehicle and do your fucking job. And he did it in front of my blokes, mate. And uh, like back in the day, mate, I had a bit of a temper. And uh, 
I was like, right, don't, not, not right now. And I was like, okay. And in my mind, that somehow, mate, to me, was like him calling me a coward. Yeah. And that's how I felt. I was like, you're calling me a fucking coward mm-hmm. here. Do you not, like, do you think I'm stupid or something? And a lot of it on, I'm not blaming it on him, mate, but I'm just saying that he, he had it within his grasp to be like, we're not doing that. We're not, that's pointless. We shouldn't be doing that. But he didn't. He didn't want to lose face to his higher ups, to his bat, you know, to the battle group and all that. He didn't want to back out. He was like, "Now nah, we're doing it." So we're doing it. You're sitting here while we're doing it, okay? And off we went. And my so I my vehicle was the first one out of the compound, and I pulled out to cover all the lads coming out. My mate, as he went past me, and we talked about this later on. That he goes, I remember nodding, like sort of nodding, your mate, sort of like. And he nodded at me and I nodded at him and he was like, I just knew when I saw your face that, yeah, it's not, this is going to go bad. And literally 20 minutes later, bang. Oh, fucking, that was it, mate. So my platoon's, platoon sergeant's vehicle, I was last. We used to take it in turns, you know, it's my turn to go to the front today or whatever. And my vehicle was last vehicle. And uh, never done it before. We um, In the Jackals, you got these really like good seats they're like mine proof seats meant to be they're meant they've got like a cross on them underneath so if you hit a mine it should collapse ideally not breaking you and uh they've got like a like a racing harness you know the ones that, mm. but no one ever uses it mate because you've got all manner of kit on you're in and out of the vehicle all the time it's just a waste of time but what they have is like a little lap belt thing that you can just clip and what it ideally does is if you're in country where you're sort of traversing up slopes and stuff that vehicle rolls you're probably going to fall out and get squashed so it's a little yeah, okay. thing that you can just bang on mm. i stopped i had this horrible feeling mate and i stopped everyone just stop 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 on the radio and i goes right just everyone put your belts on just put your lap belts on just just do it just do it because i think i just it's a bad place literally rolled forward 10 meters bang the f- id mate just straight under my vehicle like f- what they said afterwards because they they come out and sort of do a quick estimation and stuff they reckon it was about 30 40 kilos of explosive like which is homemade explosive so maybe that's less powerful i don't know but yeah it ruined my day mate so that's that's yeah yeah brought the vehicle off but yeah fucked. that was it that was it mate that was the end end of my career that was it done so uh my chain of command mate i got a lot uh a lot of blood on the hands not mine but what I would say is that six days after I got injured and Rad has talked about his mates and I would never say that they were my mates. I knew knew them, liked them, respected them. Three guys out of four on a vehicle, same thing, but more explosive. They got killed six days after. And then after that, they decided, oh, we're not, we're not going to use the jackals in the green zone anymore. We're going to use helicopters. So it took... Me getting blown up, losing my career, which is, that only affects me, that's fine. Three guys getting killed before they said, oh yeah, oh yeah, actually, we'll stop doing that now. And uh, Is this from the same boss that told you, get out there? Same guy, mate, yeah. And his, so on our sergeant major, mate, and do you know what, mate, if I, I would say this to them if I saw them. Have you is, seen him since? Yeah. How did that make you feel? Uh, he, I think he, he was lucky I was injured mate like as a bloke I don't mind someone calling me a coward if I'm a coward or mate that's shit you're shit if I'm shit call a spade a spade that's fine but when even me if I've got experience and you haven't and I'm Obviously, it's dependent how you tell someone, right? But if you actually like, look, this is going to go wrong. There's another way to do it. We can do it this way, and they don't listen, and it goes wrong. uh, That's a stupidity that you can't correct. You can't correct that stuff, mate. And I think the... So he ended up... I'm not sure if I should mention this, but I am. Yeah, bollocks, who cares? He... I found out after I got injured... Um, I'm in rehab and uh, I found out mate it was these amounts of money 
going into my bank account. Oh, that's actually weird. It's just when I sort of logged on to online banking. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And it was from him. He got my bank deals, mate. And he's putting money in my account. I had to get in touch with him. So what are you doing? Why are you doing that? So it's, it's just uh, just a little thing to help. I'm like, fucking guilt money then, yeah. yeah. And I was like, you need to stop doing that. Stop it. Right now. Like, and, you know, I was like, don't ever do shit like that. And he tried getting in touch a couple of times over the years. Um, and it puts me wrong, mate. It, I don't, I'm not sure if it's, maybe it's weak on my part. It's weakness, I don't know. But it puts me into this horrible state where I have this like cloud over my head, mate. And I start thinking of these really bad things. And I'm like, if I see him or the Sergeant Major ever, it's going to go wrong. You know, don't let the legs fool you. Yeah. I'll, you know, I'm just, mm. I'll, if I saw them, mate, I don't think I could really control, you know, I think mm. it's just not a good thing to think about. And I can't ever... It's been long enough now. It should be over it. It should be over that. So this is 2009. I'm not even annoyed at the bloke that blew me up, mate. Yeah. Not even... Whoever it was that, like, connected that battery pack yeah. and blew me up, I think, yeah, fair play. Good shot. Yeah. Good on you. I survived, so it's not that big a deal. But it was more the thought process and the sort of... the ignorance behind what they did. It just showed a real lack of professionalism and... The annoying thing was, mate, that unit, there was so many good bosses and sergeant majors and we got dicked with the two worst ones that just weren't liked. And we're like, why? Why did we have to them two? But yeah, it's just the way it goes. What do you remember of that day? At that moment when you got blown up? Screaming. I remember like, um, not me, but like it's weird. Like, So I remember the bang and I heard, I heard it. I just remember the the bang, and I just remember spinning round. So I came out in the in the chair, like attached still, and spin round, and the road had a little wall where the jackal, it's like eight ton, it blew it up onto the wall, so it's a fair old kick, mm. and it blew me out and it blew me over the wall, which had a big drop the other side, and that's what kind of did a lot of my injuries. So in the front of the jackal, you've got like the like my GPMG, my machine gun on the front, but in the green zone, it's so like close. You're not really sort of using that. You've, you've got your pistol really. And in the door, I had my personal rifle and it, maybe it was a bad habit. I don't know, but I used to sit with my arm on the door and when the blast went off, the rifle went straight through my arm, like broke, broke my forearm. So as I landed, I remember the dust settling and I, I broke all the the bones uh, in my uh, on my ribs around the back, just with it wrenching out. My shoulder blade like snapped in two as well, so my elbow was dislocated. So being a bit dramatic, mate, but like w when I lay down in the seat, I was still in the seat. I couldn't feel my legs. And I was thinking, "Fuck, just what the hell is going on?" And I couldn't breathe. I thought, "I'm dying." I was raging, mate. I was like raging and. I was like, I can't believe I'm dying here. Like, I'm fucking hell. Like, I'm just, I'm not. So, like I said, my wife was pregnant at the time. I'm like, I can't believe I'm not going to get to see my kid because of this. This is just shit. And I just, you have to, when I, when I realised I could breathe, because I couldn't breathe, right? It's like if you get really badly winded, but eventually, because you, your body and the adrenaline kicks in, you do start to get a little breath. And I remember starting to get a bit of breath and I was like, right, what's happened to me? And I had like loads of dust in your eyes and all my kit had been blown off, uh, off my body armor. I had nothing, I had like nothing on me. And uh, I look at my arm and I could see the, the open fracture and I was like, fuck, I was bleeding. So I put a tourniquet, I managed to tourniquet, but because I dislocated my elbow, it was like, pulling the bone, it was like pushing the bones, mm. but you've got to, you just got to do it one more turn for luck, haven't yeah, you? Yeah. Uh, so I did what I could with that. And as I looked down, my legs were straight as far as my knees went. 
But then I looked further down and my both feet were like completely round the wrong way. I was like, oh shit, that's my tap dancing days are over here. Like, I was like, this ain't good. And I think it was a blessing that I couldn't feel my legs. I just couldn't, I just didn't know what was going on. I don't mean I was paralyzed. I just, I couldn't feel anything. And uh, it turned out I had a spinal fracture. And I think that's, that's obviously what it was. And do you know what I mean? I'm so lucky because I thought that the whole convoy had been killed and blown up. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was just so disoriented. I thought everyone's been killed. I'm the only one alive. And uh, I think people have mentioned it before, but there's a bit of a price on your head as a as a as a British sort of serviceman out there, right? They if they if they could catch you, that for them is just like yeah. you know, so all the Christmases come at once, yeah. but they don't do Christmas. But they um they uh, I was lying there and I'm like, I'm gonna get snatched, I'm gonna get taken, I'm gonna you know, and it was it was on my mind and I'm like, how am I supposed to defend myself? Like what am I supposed to do? Mm. And I just I was like, fuck, I'm just going to have to, with one arm, I'm just going to have to, like, if anyone comes at me, I'm just going to have to, like, swing until I can't do mm. anymore. Just give a good account of yourself. And it's just the weird things that go through your head. I mean, there probably, there was no one there to do it, but it's just the fear factor, I guess, and probably shows that I was scared. But I tried to give myself morphine, and I did the typical thing of uh, when I went to inject it, I hit my hip bone <laughs> and I bent the needle. <laughs> so I was like, oh, for fuck. I was like, I can't even do that right. <laughs> what the fuck? I was raging. Yeah. And uh, by this point, the blokes had found me. They'd seen where I was and they had to clear a point to me. So they had to obviously clear it for, for IEDs yeah. and stuff. So they managed to clear a point to me. And at this point, they're essentially doing my job as a platoon sergeant. So my job, or one of my jobs on the ground is Kazivak, right? It's to casualty evac the lads out and they're doing it. And I was just like, oh, mate, I felt so ashamed. That I, I sound stupid, but I felt ashamed that I got injured like a, like an idiot. I should have done more. And I was so scared that one of the other lads got injured and it was like my fault for not sort of doing more to not do it. And when I found out that I was the only one that was critical, I felt relief. I felt like this great weight lifted off me. Like I was just like, is everyone all right? And they're like, yeah, everyone's all right. The medics broke his leg and his arm, but it's, it's just you two. And I was like, good. I'm glad that was good. And that was fine. And I kind of felt that because that had happened, maybe it meant the lads will go the rest of the tour without anything significant happening, which is the most you can hope for, isn't it? You just think, well, even if I die, then it means that, I don't know, it, it's just that luck thing mm. that you think, well, we've used our luck then, that's fine. I'll take the hit if it means that you guys can get away with it. It's not like that, but that's how you think. Mm. Well, that's how I thought. And then they were calling in uh, for, um, they were calling in for a Kazivak for a helicopter to land. And at the time, mate, there was that many casualties all over the, the place that, which, they were like, we're not committing a, we're not committing a helicopter. It's going to get shot down where where you guys are. And again, luck, pure luck. So they, the only option really was to put me in a vehicle and drive me out, which is going to take forever. And I was already going into shock. Um, you know, I was had a lot of injuries going on. What in, what injuries did you have from this? So all all my ribs broken. Um. I, I didn't collapse a lung, but I was I was bad the internal sort of on that side, open fracture, dislocated elbow, broke my scapula, snapped, fractured the bottom three vertebrae, which is why I had the problems with my legs, and then my legs. If you might, when you're in the vehicle, if you your feet are on the floor, when the bomb went off, it just hit my legs, and when they X-rayed my my feet and ankles, it it was. The way they explained it to me, it was like if you got a crunchy bar and just smashed it all up, they were like, that, that's your lower legs, mate. They were like, there's nothing there to fix. They're fucked. You know, this, you know, like they go in and they put wire in and do this and yeah. do that and do the next thing. There was nothing to yeah. connect wire to. They were like, we just, we don't know what to do with this. So I had all that and the, the sort of pain that goes with it. You're in ex extreme, well, might be a, bit of a wimp but like I 
was in an extreme amount of pain, I felt anyway. And uh, so they're like, we, we need to drive him out. Mate, the chances of driving me out without hitting another IED, it's not, that's definitely not going to happen. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna, going into shock. All these different things there, like, look, he's in a bad way. We need to get him out. And Were you looking down just seeing blood everywhere? Yeah, mate, I was just covered in it. I was covered in blood and dust. And I think I think it was good that the dust covered, covered a lot of it. Okay. Do you know what I mean? So okay. I was just, and plus, I, I was in shock, mate. So I'm just like, what's Were going on? Were you thinking at that time, like, I've lost my legs for life? Well, I hadn't lost my legs at this point, mate. They were still, they were still they were there. Still they were just, they were still attached. But upside down. But just simply, yeah. So they're still there. So I'm thinking, I've kept my legs. Yeah. I'm all right. Uh, I'm okay. Like it's, I'll be, I'll be back out to theatre in six weeks because yeah. broken legs, I'll be fine. And um, little did I know. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, there was a Black Hawk helicopter, American helicopter, flying back to camp with. Um, have you heard the PJs, mm. our rescue yeah. guys? Really cool guys, yeah. right? They were on their last call. So they'd done their last call. They were flying back to camp, de kitting and then f- going home. They were just going home. And they picked up the call and they said, we'll come and get him. And they come in, put me on the Black Hawk and got me out, which that, that saved my life, mate. De- definitely saved my life, yeah. uh, without a doubt. And I managed to, f- years later, I found them all. I found Did that you? crew, mate. Yeah, yeah. That's a dit on its own, mate. Wow. I, yeah, I found them all. And I got a really cool photograph of them all. Quality. Yeah, m- amazing. Where were you when you were told all these injuries some of it was at Bastion. So they get you back to Bastion, which was like an incredible medical facility. And they put my arm in a cast straight away, and reset it all and, and all the rest of it. The rest of it, mate, was like a bugger's muddle. They're like, we need to get you back to UK now. And they they get you back at a, a big C-17 aircraft, massive thing. And then they do it out like an operating theatre and they get all the guys that are intensive care or they don't think they're going to make it. They put them in there and they get them straight back to the UK to Selyoke, it was, in Birmingham uh, Hospital. And there's a ward at Selyoke that they had purely for, for military. But I went to intensive care because I was in a, in a bad way. And uh, my wife, she met me in Selyoke and I was in intensive care. And I had... Um, do you know compartment syndrome? Mm. It's like uh, in all my lower legs because of the trauma, all the muscles and all the rest of it with the internal bleeding and all the trauma, they wanted to expand, but there's no room. So yeah. what they end up doing is they cut you open. They just cut them open to let the pressure out and you end up with these like really weird big diamond scars all over your legs and feet and stuff. And uh, may I just, it was weird. I was on a lot of, pain meds so I didn't know the extent of my injuries at all not a clue I just knew that I was in a in a, a sort of bad way but my wife would come in and out and and sort of visit me and all the rest of it and she I mean she she's got her version of events you know and she told me she's oh the first night in intensive care they don't kick they don't kick you out you know that you miss us whatever they they, they they let you stay in for for obvious reasons and I always remember lying in bed and she was lay with her head on the bed like like that, just sort of like dozing. Uh, God knows what time it was. And bear in mind a spinal fracture and I'm in this like wacky uh, inflatable mattress to keep me stable. I sat up, mate, with the pain, just bolt upright and I started screaming. And jeez, uh, mate, the pain. And uh, they were like, quickly, they were like, it's compartment syndrome. They got me down to the operating theatre, opened me all up sorted it all out as best they could and while they were doing that they were like to my wife you're gonna have to go and the welfare officer on the unit was just like an absolute legend of a guy mate a guy called ray just a a great human being and uh he'd got her a hospital uh, a hotel just down the road so she could be back and forth you know and she goes oh right i'll i'll be in tomorrow then to to see him and the doc was like uh, right, we need to have a word about that. And so, I said, look, you, we can't 100% guarantee he's 
going to make it through the night. We don't know what's going to happen. He's Jesus. he's ill. He's not well. Wow. He's an ill guy, right? And uh, mate, she was dealing with that five months pregnant on her own, mate. And the stress was just like... So not only did I feel bad that I'd left all my blokes in theatre to crack another three months and I'm not there. Not only did I not stick up for the blokes that got me blown up, I'm now a burden to my wife and putting her through all this at a time when she should be enjoying a pregnancy and there's me banging on about being injured. It just just felt like a like a burden, mate. Just an absolute burden. And I used to I used to hope sometimes that I wouldn't wake up and it would just be over and she could move on. Because that's how you rationalise this stuff, yeah. right? You're like, if I'm not here, I'm not a problem. I'm not realising that they don't look at it that way. Yeah. But yeah, so did five months in hospital. Um, and they're like, you get to a point in hospital. And they, I used to drive the doctor wild, mate. I used to annoy him. And he'd come round on a ward round and he'd speak to each individual person. How's it going? How's your pain? How's this? How's that? Any questions? I'm like, yeah, when am I going to be up running and doing this and doing that? Can I get out for the end of the tour? Can I do this? Can... And he's, he, he was a military doctor, right? And he's just looking at me like, yeah, well, well, we'll see how it goes. And just wouldn't tell me, not tell me the truth, but he's like expectation management, right? And at the end of it, just before I was going off to rehabilitation, I still have my legs. Still, I'm in a wheelchair. I'm in a one-armed wheelchair thing. And uh, he wanted to speak to me before I went. And I said, Luke, when am I going to get up and about and sort of back to full fitness? And he, mate, he'd had this for five months, right? He's like, right, mate, we need to have a chat. And my wife was there, which kind of made it harder. But I'm glad, I'm glad, I was glad that he was honest, really. And he goes, Luke, you need to realise, mate, that how you are now, that's your life. You're not going to get up. You're not going to be walking anywhere. The chances of you walking across a car park are like zero. You, your life has changed now. You're disabled. You're disabled. Like, and I was like, ah, oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. Just put a massive front on. My wife went. So you're all right. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, she went. Got the nurse to pull the cover, the curtain around my bed. I literally rolled over me, and I'm I'm not too proud to say me. I just put my head in my pillow and just cried mate I was just like everything's over now how am I supposed to look after my wife my career's over not that that's a great loss to the military I'm not mm. saying I was the greatest guy ever but I liked my job mate I liked it and I liked the blokes I loved the blokes never let me down and I felt like I let them down um, I was a promoted early so I knew that I was going to promote again and mm. I was doing alright I was doing fine and it's all gone and now I'm um, having to adjust to being disabled, if you want to call it that, or whatever you want to call it. And I, again, like bad temper, but I lost my shit to myself. And I was like, right, you fucking prick. You're going to go to rehab and you're going to do everything it takes. You're going to smash yourself. Whatever it is, whatever it takes to, to, to get to as good as you can be, either in a wheelchair whatever it is you're going to do that and don't do anything else just do that so I went down to Headley Court and again I didn't so the place has got loads of people in rehab or mostly uh, guys that have been injured in theatre but others that aren't and I didn't speak to anyone mate I just got there got my bed space and went about my business and after a year um, my physio, because you get one physio who's dedicated to you because they need to understand what's happening with you. And uh, we got on top of the spinal stuff and the arm fixes and everything was going all right, mate. But legs, mate, I just, it felt constantly like I was walking on broken glass. Yeah, It's just pain, mate. And uh, the thing with pain is, right, you take pain meds and pain meds will blast but then your pain increases, you take more. That's not working, so we're going to move you okay. on to this. So I was taking more Oromorph, yeah. morphine, tramadol. I'm taking uh, ketamine. I'm taking, you name it, mate. It was like a great night out. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't feel a thing. Like, tap dancing. And uh, 
but it ruins everything, right? So like you're not sleeping properly, you're not eating properly. I, I went from like fourteen stone when I was blown when I got mm. blown up to nine stone, mate. I was just like like a bag of smash crabs, mate. Mm. I was just baggage. And uh my physio got to the point where she was like, Look, your legs, your ankles, everything, they're getting worse. Like your pain's increasing, everything's getting worse. And I'm like, Yeah, I'd, I'd, I can't sleep with the pain. I could stand on this like big Zimmer frame thing. You'd stand, I could wait there for like a minute and then I'd have to sit down and I'd be dripping with sweat, mate. And I'd just be in so much pain. And I'm like, Is this not, is this going to get better? Like, and she's like, I don't think so. I was like, okay. And I went to see a specialist in uh, Bristol. And he was just an old an old fella. Nothing to do with the military. Just this lower leg specialist guy. And uh, the car park's on a hill for a start. And I'm in a wheelchair. And I'm like, great start. Hill reps <laughs> with one arm. <laughs> this is great. So I got in the hospital already annoyed. Mm. And uh, speak to this guy. And uh, he goes, look... I'm going to be honest, I haven't looked through your, your notes. I haven't looked at anything. I just, I want to talk to you. Okay. And he goes, what do you want out of life? You know, what do you want going forward? I was like, oh, that's an old question. And he goes, I'm not talking about amputations. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I need to know where you are. What do you want? And I says, all right, okay. I goes, well, my daughter is six months old. And by the time she goes to school, I want to be able to walk her to and from school, not in pain. That's all I want. And he's like, okay. He goes, well, that's not going to happen unless you have amputations. Because I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just saying you're going to have to have all sorts of operations and we can work on pain. We can work on this. You can keep them, but you're going to be wheelchair bound. And I'm like, nope. And he's like, okay, okay. He goes, well, in that case, we go for two below knee amputations and you start again. Fine, do it, let's do that. And he's like, you sure? And I says, okay. I goes, well, if I was your son, what would you tell me to do? And he was like, ah. He goes, you got me there, mate. <laughs> I was like, well, what would you do? He yeah. goes, no one's ever asked me that. Yeah. And he goes, amputate. I went, fine, let's go. Two weeks later, mate, I had my legs off. and From the knee down? No, halfway down the shin. Halfway down the shin? Yeah. So if you went halfway down the shin, yep. down, yep. so ankle and all the rest yep. of them, sort of about that much, really. Yeah. So I'm, I genuinely, and it's fine, all the boys that have stepped on things and lost their legs, yeah. to them, I am a token effort amputee, right? Yeah. I'm a proper, like, I'm not even a proper amputee, <laughs> mate. Um, How do they cut your legs off? Yeah, yeah. So How? Um, so what they do is they... Um, they did both of mine at the same time, right? So, you know, saying you that doctor said yeah. you're never going to walk again. Yeah. Well, he was he was working at the hospital and he was doing one of the amputations. He was doing like the left leg, and this other doctor was doing the right. And he came to see me, and they obviously come to see you and they mark you up, like the rough line of yeah. where they're going to go and blah blah blah. And he's like, "Got any questions?" I was like, oh, "I just wanted to say I told you so." And he was like, "What?" I was like, you don't remember, do you? And he was like, what do you mean? I says, oh, you said I'd never walk again, yeah, didn't you? And he went, yeah. I went, pure, after these, I'm good to go. Like, yeah. And he was like, fair point, fair <laughs> point. I'll give you that. So what they do, mate, is they um, they get you in and they give you an epidural. Yep. So they clearly numb you uh, all the way down. And then they, they it's the way it was explained to me was they kind of open you up, they open your leg up like a banana. So they, they cut the bone. And then where it where the sort of end of the stump, sorry, yeah. the end of the stump has been opened yeah. like that. They tie off all the nerve endings and they at the bottom of your stump sew it together like that. Okay. So you've got this neat little scar yeah, at okay. the bottom. Yeah. And um, the only problem on my legs was I had a lot of skin grafts from where the compartment syndrome and stuff. Mm. And I had a lot of metal work in that they had to pull everything out before they cut your legs off. Um but no joke. Um, when I came round, I'm in the ward. They didn't have to give me anything for pain. I was in no pain, mate. And my wife dropped me off the day before at the hospital, and I was like, I, I, I want the day. I want the day to just sort myself out. You know, I don't want you hanging around, kind of thing. It won't be very nice for you. And got myself into that mindset of I know what I'm doing. 
come round, she come to see me and she was like, your face was completely different. She was like, you just looked like you were all right. So then I was a normal, but I thought it was a normal thing, like a normal amputee. Started again at Headley Court, but with prosthetics. And then then your life is on a different tra- trajectory. Okay. Now you're sort of thinking, look, it's under my steam now. Yeah. I can do my own thing. What, what, what do I want to do? I need to start pushing myself. Wow, what a lovely feeling that must oh, have been. It's, yeah. I've got a photo of me yeah. on an old Nokia phone, standing up for the first time, no pain. And uh, I look like a Lego man, right? mm. but it's I was just in no pain, mate. I'm like, right, we're now we're starting. Now, now we're, we're good to go. We're doing it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And that was great, mate. That was just the best. Fair yeah. play, Dan. Jeez, like, but it wasn't uncommon, mate. I no, wasn't the I only know. one, you know. No, I know that. You but know? here, listening yeah. to your listening yeah. to your story here, yeah. what was the, what was the next movement when you was like, right? Because I can see you're a determined human being, right? <laughs> yeah. And I know what you've achieved since. What have you achieved since that fatal day? Oh, yeah. With the five months in hospital, I, every day, mate, I used to see the nurses and all uh, all the healthcare staff and doctors coming in and just cracking on all day, every day. And they were phenomenal, mate. Just, they come and I was in pain one time, mate, and all the nurse did was come and hold my hand. I was yeah. crying. I was in an absolute state, just sat there and hold my hand. You can't Lovely. pay that back, mate. Lovely. You can't pay that yeah, back, right? Agree. If I could, if I was a multimillionaire, I would have found every single one of them and give them a check yeah. for a gazillion pounds, yeah. but you can't. So I said to my wife in Oswald, I says, look, when I'm able, I'm going to do something. I just, I, just so they all know that all the work they did for me was worth it. Yeah. It seems daft, right? But it's the only thing I could think of. First thing I did was uh, I met this bloke who's uh, he was an ex Royal Marine, so immediately alarm bells are ringing, right? <laughs> oh, strange blokes, isn't he? And he um, he was a physiotherapist, <laughs> right? He got out and he was a physio, yeah. and uh, we got chatting and uh, we, we we hit it off. Really nice bloke, mm. Nick, and uh, he said, like, "What do you like doing before you got blown up, mate?" And I was like, "Well, I like to have my legs, but apart from that, I like cycling." And he was like, all oh, right, yeah. He goes, we should we should do something for charity, mate. And I was like, I haven't really thought about doing anything for charity. I was like, yeah, that sounds good. And I, this was just after my amputations, like a few months after. And I thought he meant like a cycle as in like, I don't know, 100 miles over mm. a few days or something. I don't know. It's not like he didn't know I was banged up. Mm. And he got in touch with me months later and he goes, you start for doing that cycle? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I was living in Suffolk at the time. And I thought he meant like, we'll go Norwich to Ipswich yeah, yeah, or yeah. something like and that. And then back again Yeah, after a couple of beers. So, yeah, <laughs> ideal. I'll yeah. do two Guinness, mate. It's fine. And uh, mate, he's uh, he goes, right. He goes, I've jacked it up. We're doing Land's End to John O'Groat. <laughs> right. And you're like typical blokes, mate. You're like, oh, no worries, mate. Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking, I-, I haven't got a bike. Yeah. I-, I-, I was, when we're going? And he was like, oh, like, May and it was like April. I'm like, yeah, yeah, good, good to go, mate. I'll meet you there. All uh, right, okay. I was like, I'm not backing down. And yeah. mate, do you know, like psychologically, I was spent. I was still in my married quarter. Yeah. Um, every morning, mate, I'd be sat there with a the baby, which was bliss. But I'd watch people going to work. Yeah. In uniform. Is that the hardest, <sighs> mate. I'm yeah. just like, what am I doing? I'm doing nothing. This is just like pointless. I need something to do, right? And when that text came through, I'm like, I don't care if I get 10 miles. I don't care if I don't get a Cornwall. I'm doing it. I'm doing something. So the agreement was that like, he goes, right, you do the fundraising. I'll do the admin for the Mm -hmm. cycle. I was like, okay, that's fine. Right. He didn't do any admin. So we get down to Land's End, right? (laughs) And I'm like, okay, so what we do? He goes, oh, we're just going to do YMCA's all the way up. It's going to be fine, easy. I'm like, all right, cool, yeah. So we went down to Land's End to get a photo as proof that we mm. were doing the cycle, right? And we did it a night before because we were staying six mile away. So we'll cycle down, photo, job done, start next morning. Mate, I was on this junker of a bike, right? And he's like, you haven't trained, have you? And I'm like, not Really, no. And he's like, oh, God, that's going to take a long time. I'm like, so what? 
<laughs> and this guy, so if you've ever been down there, there's like a, a front sort of thing where you get the phone mm. and then there's a big grass yep. bit. There was all these trucks and people milling around and this guy knocking about in uniform and he could he was looking over. Mate, it's just pure luck, right? We changed the date we were doing it three times. And as we're cycling up the road, this guy comes over and he's like waving. I'm like, all right. And he's like, all right, lads, what, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, we're doing land to John O'Groats. And he goes, oh, what way are you going? And this Nick goes, oh, we're just heading north. <laughs> and I looked at him and I was like, hang on. I thought you were navigating it. And he was like, yeah, it'd be fine. I'm like, all right. And he's looking at me, obviously. And he's like, what, what are you doing this for, lads? I'm like, oh, we're doing it for, for charity. Half for charity of Nick, half for charity of mine. Yeah. And he's like, right, you're self-sufficient. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, what, in what way, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, well, Nick sorted out accommodation all the way up. And he was like, most of the way, yeah. And he was like, lads, do you want to come over and have a have a brew? And we're like, yes, please. And we went and sat down at this table with him. And he's like, just chat me through your plan. It turns out Nick hadn't done any admin, mate, nothing. <laughs> and he goes, look, I'll be honest. He goes, we're doing this ride, lands into John O'Groats for Royal British Legion. Fully supported. All you have to do is cycle every day. There's a load of us doing it. People had paid to do it, yeah. but they're leading it as a group thing. We've had a few people not turn up. And before he could get the words out right, he's like, do you? I went, yes. <laughs> he went, do you want to come? I yes. Mean, yeah. Yes. Yes, we do. He goes, oh, cool. Yeah. He goes, we've got hotels every night. We've yeah. got this. we got that. I'm like, happy Bro. days. And he goes, no offense, mate. He goes, uh, is that your bike? I was like, yeah. He goes, do you want one that fits? I was like, yeah. He goes, well, we've got a spare bike that'll fit you. I went, oh, brilliant. <laughs> so, mate, it was bliss. But it was, it was, it sucked. Like, yeah. we did 10 days, right? So, we did like, like a lot of mileage. How a day. many miles are you doing roughly a day? Well, to get out of Cornwall and that, I think the first day we did like about sixty odd mile. Yeah. And we did that for two days. And and, then, then, and and for you when you're cycling, what was that feeling like for cycling? What was there pain? Was there what mate, it was I went from no training to that. And yeah. It was it was stupid. I wouldn't recommend it. But if you took the circumstances I was doing it in I was doing it because I just needed something. Something, yeah. To, I just to focus in on. I'd rather sit on a bike hanging out in the pissing rain yeah. than sit there doing nothing, whinging about poor me. Yeah, okay. Because misery loves company. And yeah. I was like, nah, I, I need to do. And um, so some days they were like 100 mile days, mate. And I'll, I'll be honest, mate, I'd stop. 100 miles, still a long way. It's, mate. It's a long way, isn't it? Yeah. Mate, like, I mean, sometimes, I'll be honest, mate, going up some of the hills, my bike, my legs would just stop, and the minibus would be there, and like hold on to the wing mirror, yeah. and like get me up the hill, yeah. and then go. But mate, it's oh, it's all part of it, yeah. you know. And we we did it in ten days, mate. And I think from then on, my outlook changed on everything. Right, mm. I was like, it felt good. <clears throat> excuse me, it felt good to raise money because I knew that was going to help people. That aren't going to get on a bike and aren't going to cycle. Yeah. They're in a real state, right? And then physically, I felt good because I was physically tired, mate. That physical yeah. tiredness of, I think I've done something is, is good, but it only lasts so long. Mm. And that's when uh, my wife actually saw that they were looking for volunteers, injured veterans, to do an expedition to the South Pole. She saw it online. And this is a few months after uh, the the cycle, and I was yeah. I was starting to annoy her because I'm <laughs> kicking around the house, mate. Yeah, like most blokes. Yeah, most annoy. And she's like, I've seen this thing to go to South Pole. I'm like, oh, I'll be away a lot with that. She's like, I I'll help sign you up. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're brilliant. That's awesome. Good so, wife. So honestly, you you probably it says you'd be away for eight months. So I'm like, yeah. yeah, it's bad. Shit. No, it's honestly. I'll, 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 I'll get around it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. And, uh, but nah, she, she was great, mate. She helped me. What's your wife's name? Kim. Okay, massive Kim. shout out to Kim, by the way. It's a mate. For I'll being beside you. your side for all of this and she, pregnant five months. And human beings, mate, can only take so much. Yeah. And she took it all, mate. And I'll be honest, I wasn't the best bloke to be around, mate. Yeah. There were some bad times. Mm. And she was the only one there to to take it and don't get me wrong mate the one to be like you need to sort this out yeah you know and when you dangle losing your wife and your child 
because you've been a lesser human, but because you, you're feeling sorry for yourself, mate. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. With me, I'm not. Yeah. I would never criticize yeah. anyone else. You need to prioritize everything then, and you say, right, no, no, this stops now. You need to be a better guy. I need to be better than this. And if she wasn't tough, if she was like, tough, love me, right, yeah. which is a real place for that. Yeah, and uh, that's what she did. And then I didn't want my daughter to grow up with a dad who always has had an excuse for not doing something. Mm. I can't take it to the park because I can't be bothered. I'm not putting the effort in. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. Of course, I'll take it to the park. Yeah. I'll just put my legs on. Yeah. I want you to realize that it's all right. Dad's a bit different. Still smash the dads on sports day. Yeah. <laughs> well easy. <laughs> My piece of cake, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And uh, <laughs> I want her to realize that it's not all bad. Mm. My wife and my daughter weren't in the military. Mm. There's no way they should have a bad time because of that. It's not fair. It's not right. So I tried to sort of do that. And the only way I could do it was by doing physical challenges because that then moved my needle. Yeah. To, you know the other way yeah. to go no nah, no nah, no nah, i can do that yeah. and a lot of it mate was failing you know falling over and hurting yourself and not doing very well and getting back up and going right okay i need so to be better you, so you're having to learn to walk again yeah as an adult yeah fall i'll tell you what mate see falling over as an adult yeah it's embarrassing mate right do it a hundred times you're over it it's not a big deal okay. you're all right it's like whoop de do. And you have to go back to that mentality of being a child again, of I've got to try, I've got to do it. If I don't do it, how am I supposed to know? Yeah. And yeah, you're going to fall over and you're tired all the time and your coordination's rubbish. But as an amputee, I think it's fair to say the only way to get good at walking again is by just walking, yeah. just doing it again and again and again. A lot of it's prosthetics, comfort and all the rest of it. That's, you know, that's another thing, but... You've got to just keep going and going and mm. going. And that, uh, that for me, was the main thing, right? Just do that. Can I take a look at your prosthetics? Of course you can. Is that yeah, right? Absolutely. Just yeah, so I can see on, the, just see, on the, see on the camera. All carbon. Huh? You know, all carbon. All carbon. There you are. Wow. Sorry to be standing on the table there. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, she is. But, um, yeah, there's a, a friend of mine who became a friend in Italy, made them. And, and is that so? Basically, you're slotting in and going right. I'm going to go skiing. I'm going to go walking. I'm going to go cycling. And yeah, just go for it, mate. Unbelievable. It's um, it, a lot of it, mate, is the skill of the the prosthetist, yes. right? To and is there different levels of? It, I'd say they all learn from the same book. Yeah, but they're essentially making something with their hands. Yeah. To mould your leg. Yeah. Okay. And the guy, Silvio, uh, who made it in Italy, yeah. who made my legs, mate, he is just like the best human being. Mm. He's a lovely man. Mm. Just a lovely, he's an artisan, mate. He can only work on his own, yeah. right? Because he just doesn't like people. People. <laughs> he's hilarious, mate. <laughs> Loses his temper, yeah. right? And we met after my first attempt. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My first attempt on uh, the Marathon de Saab. And hold on, hold on. You've done the Marathon de Saab? Yeah, but what I would say is it took me two times, mate. So don't be, I wouldn't be too impressed. Like, Mate, but, hold on a bit. Marathon de Saab, that's, that's six marathons in six days. Five days, yeah. You do six a double marath marathon one day, mate. You do two marathons in one day, yeah. Six yeah. marathons in five days and two marathons in one in day. In one day, mate, yeah. And you've done that? I did, mate. Yeah, yeah. First, first amputee to double amputee to do it. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. That was a good one. And where's that? That's in the um, Morocco. Morocco. Yeah, Moroccan Sahara Desert. Yeah. In temperatures of, oh, mate. The you, the first year I failed it. Second year went back, and it was like fifty odd degrees, mate. It's hot. It's hot. I'm from Scotland, mate. I can, I can Massive respect. I'm from, I'm, I'm from Scotland, mate. I can handle it. I can, yeah. Desert ready. Factor 50. Yeah, desert ready, mate. Four, skin, four cornered Henke. Skin like tracing paper. <laughs> Bloody hell. Wow. Yeah, that was a good one. How do you train for the Marathon de Sable? So, it all leads on. So, I did South Pole. Yeah. And, and then, through the charity, I did the London Marathon. And when I was doing the London Marathon... 
I wanted to prove to the charity, right, that I could do a marathon distance thinking that if I do that, I can then get a slot on the marathon to sub because I'll think they'll be, they'll think, oh, yeah, it's good, it good it, yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're good for it. But the problem was no double amputee had done it before, right? And one of the th- things that you often come up against with stuff like this is it's visual, right? It's a visual injury. And a lot of times people will look at it and be like, I maybe couldn't do that, so I'm not sure how you're going to do it. Therefore, I don't think you should yeah, do it, okay. right? That's fine. Okay, That's yeah. human nature. Yeah. Right? It's absolutely fine. Yeah. So I asked Ed Parker, the the who was the, the CEO of the charity, any chance I could get a slot to do Marathon Saab? And he was like, yeah, that's going to be a great fundraiser, right? I was like, right, brilliant. And again, the motivator was raise money. If you said, like, I probably can't help another veteran mm. one-to-one, but if me walking across a desert, raising X amount of money yeah. helps a veteran. It's going to yeah, okay. Good, do, yeah, that, okay. that's worth it, right? Yeah. That's good. And from a selfish point of view, I wanted to try and be the first double amputee to do it, right? I just wanted to try it. So I trained the only way I knew how. So I trained like I trained for the South Pole, like London Marathon. I just went out and covered distance. So you you probably know anyway, but like you're self-sufficient on the Marathon de Saab, yeah. right? You take all your kit with you, you, everything you need, you carry. Where are you kipping? So you start and finish from like a tented camp. Yeah, amazing logistics, mate. Like, you, so it's a big horseshoe shaped tented camp, and they put these big, uh, like cloth tents yeah. up, and you just get in there. You're in the same one every single night. So your tent seven, your tent seven for the entire time, so you can find it. You're in with the same guys. It's good for yeah. it's good crack in yeah. the tent. Like, yeah. obviously, I copped a lot of uh, flack for uh, one for being in the raft, two for being like a double amputee just like I mean it was relentless <laughs> but it's brilliant right yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, class yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, they uh, yeah so I trained by t- doing like long long walks longer and longer and longer thinking that would work at this point the prosthetics that I had they were alright but you know you speak to the, the prosthetist that was making them he was like listen you can't make prosthetics for for this we don't know what the desert's going to yeah. do you can't make them flat they're not designed for that mm. mate. you know it's great that you can do it mm. but they're not designed for it so going up and over you know jebels and sand and all the rest of it we don't know what that's going to do so the first time I went out there um, I did the first three days uh, and my stumps were like getting worse and worse they were starting to really hurt on the fourth day that's the day you do the double marathon and you've got 30 odd hours to cover the distance, but you've got to get to each checkpoint in a certain time okay. or they close the checkpoint and you're you're done. Okay. So we would, me and my mate, we were just keeping our head above water. We were getting round. And what they do on the, the long day is you go up and over a, the tallest jebel out there, a big jebel Elokfal, and it is a sand covered mountain, mate. It's a beast, right? And you can see it from the distance this day. And I'm just like, oh, Maybe if I look the other way, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And you, there was a checkpoint 10K in at the base of this jebel. And I got there and I was saying to my mate, my, my stumps were like hurting, but I didn't want to tell my mate. Yeah. So we're looking at this jebel and one side of it is all sand and the other side of it is all rock. So depending on what side you get, you either come down the sand or go up the sand yeah. and same with the rock, yeah. you're ever clambering yeah. over rocks. So this time it was up the sand and there was one way that they put a rope, a big climbing rope, all the way down so you can clamber up. And I was like, that's not an option because I'm standing for such a long time. My stumps are getting worse and worse. And I, I knew that something was wrong with the, my stumps. And what it was was my shin bone. And it was, it was rubbing. rubbing. Yeah, okay. So you add sand yeah. and you add sweat. And they put this tape on my shins, which I, my fault, I never should have done it. And what that was doing was the more I was walking, the more it was tearing yeah, okay. the skin. Yeah. So I get up the top of this jebel and I sat down and I wear silicon liners on my legs. And I, what happens is the sweat typically comes out of the liners at the top and I, I wiped them and it was red. Mm. I was like, right, stumps are bleeding. Yeah. I can't take these off now. I, can't, I just have to leave them on. 
And at this point, mate, we've got like 70 odd kilometers to go. And I'm like, just going to have to grip my teeth. Just get on with it. And again, I wouldn't recommend that. And probably people watching that have done amazing preparation for stuff would be like, that's a bad move. But I was there. It was happening. I'm not just going to pull the pin then and there and be like, no, I can't do it. I had to just keep going and yeah. going and going to see what was going to happen. And at the, the end of it, mate, so we crossed the line at like 33 hours, I think. Just We just walked all through the day, all through the night, all through the next day, crossed the line. And I went to the medical tent and I just, mate, I had to be carried to the medical tent. I was in clip and uh, they're all French. It's a French run race, yeah. right? So they're all French medics and all the rest of it. And they were like, oh, we need to take your legs off. And I'm like, you can't touch them. I'll do it. And I took them off. And as I went to peel my liner off, like basically all the skin on my shin is peeling off with it, like degloving. Yeah. And I, I was just like, I'm just, I've got to do it. And I did it, mate. And I was just, oh, mate, I just knew it's over. Yeah. It's a fail. This is a fail. And uh, I had to give up. I had to stop. You have to sign the back of your uh, running number and say, I can't do it. And at the beginning, they weren't, the race organizer wasn't going to let me take part because he was like, it's too too risky. It's You, you could hurt yourself. It's just a bit short-sighted because yeah. anyone can hurt themselves yeah. out there. There's a blind guy that's done it. Do you mm. know what I mean? So eventually they were like, yeah, you can come and do it. And I got to one marathon away from finishing. I was just, I mean, I was devastated. Like, yeah. oh, And I don't mind admitting me. I was, I felt the weight of the money that we'd raised. It, people's sort of good wishes, it was all wasted. I'd failed. And uh, the guy, the race organizer came in to see me and, he, and I was glad he did in a way because he goes, uh, oh, we got it. That we thought you're going to be the first double amputee to do this. Like, you know, and it's, uh, and he goes, uh, but I guess that's why no double amputee has done it. It's too difficult. Mm. And I was like, oh, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. I was like, hang on, <laughs> hang on a minute, big guy. Yeah. And I was like, can I come back next year and try again? And he was like, yeah, okay. I was like, All right, okay. So I went back to the UK, a massive bollocking off my wife because she was like, I could tell you this was going to happen. It was going to go wrong. <laughs> and then about two seconds later, she goes, you're going to go back, right? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go back. And she's like, okay, good. And I was glad that I went and I cocked it up because I met a guy out there who was Italian. He was an Italian uh, runner stroke writer mm. for a fitness magazine. And we kind of hit it off. And he emailed me a couple of weeks after I came back and he said, I know these guys that make prosthetics out here. I've told them about you. Right. I think they can make something. Are you up for it? And I was like, yeah, mm. too right I am. Mm. And I went out to Italy, mate, and uh, none of them spoke English. And my Italian is just like, <laughs> I don't speak Italian, mate. Yeah. I'm going to shock you. And uh, so I'd like Google Translate, and they Google Translate. We had that for five days. <laughs> and at the end of it, I came back with these legs. And the difference was for the next Martha de Saab, I could train properly, okay. right? Like not just as and when mm. my legs are feeling good. I could go and knock out two, three half marathons in a week. You know, I was really ramping it up. And I was like, this is, we're good to go here. Mm. Apart, you know, there's things that happen out there that, you know, if you fall over and hurt yourself, you can't account for that stuff. But if you can get there, 90% good to go. All you've got to do is the in mental the part. And yeah. I don't know if this is a bit cheesy, mate, but mentally, I knew that I could walk. 50 odd miles in absolute pain yeah. right with my stumps that felt like they're on fire so if i've got if i've got sockets that are just a little bit better than that i'm good to go yeah and yeah we went out long story short mate we went out and uh the next year and cracked it and did it. it yeah done it mate yeah it was good unbelievable <laughs> yeah, it was mint. you got to be one of the most toughest Stupid. <laughs> human beings i've ever come across nah, mentally no, nah, do, you, do you know what I mean? No, like, I think you, no, I don't think you can say yeah, no. Like yeah. you're an extremely mentally tough human being, Duncan. To go and do the thought of doing that, even the thought of going to do that f five marathons in six days or six marathons in five days. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but you, what you year know, did you do it? Say again, buddy. What year did you do that? You're completed. It was 2017. 2017. That was when we finished. When it. you came back, how did that make you feel? Um, 
there was there was a lot of uh, so that year ITV put a thing out every night on the news, yeah, and it was like this is how he's getting on. It was a uh, reporter Dan Rivers. Yeah, he, he he was out there with us, and he was doing a little thing every day on mm-hmm. the news, like literally two minutes. But they put the fundraising number, like my fundraising details, on the telly, which ITV very rarely do. And what it meant was that the fundraising mate just went crazy. And I, every now and then, so every night in the tent, people can email you when you're out there. If you've got a running number Mm. and they know who you are, you can get this like print off of emails. Every night, mate, I was getting like a stack Mm. of emails and I was just sat there and it was people from across the world going, I'm about to lose my leg from cancer. You've just told, you know, just shown me that you can do this, you can do that. And I I was like buzzing, mate. Mm. Not even buzzing. You just, you don't feel like so much of a failure yeah. you know and I was like oh that's good and then the other side of it was I was like if I can just sort of show people that if I can drag my fat carcass around the desert and do that you just think what you can do yeah. you know you're definitely able to do more than me so mm. if I'm I am not the benchmark here you are the benchmark mm. and I just felt like it was a, a real positive me, and yeah, it was. It's hard coming down from that. You yeah, know? you're looking for the next. Thing yeah, I was about to say thing. you're looking for the next hit. What was the next hit for you? Um, oh, it's a bit sad, mate. Like so, a mate that I met on he wasn't in the military. A mate that I met on training for the South Pole, really nice guy, Jules. We were really. Sort of mates. He was the kind of guy who'd phone you up at random times, right? Yeah. And he'd chat. Absolute <laughs> fucking bollocks. Yeah. Right? I like those mates. Super guy. Yeah, yeah but great quality, guy. Yeah. A four o'clock in the morning, Brilliant. mate. You know, <laughs> you could phone that guy at stupid o'clock saying, mate, I'm stranded on the M25. Yeah, come and get me. Yeah. And you'd yeah. be like, on my way, buddy. Yeah. I really liked him. And he said to me, it was 2018. He goes, Luke. And he was a super fit guy. He was a really annoying guy, actually. Mm. He was good looking, super fit. Mm. And he had like just a, an amazing physique. Mm. It's like, stop being my friend. Like you, you depress me. <laughs> and uh, he phoned me up one night and he goes, mate, I'm desperate to do the marathon de Saab. Would you do it again? Like, you know, so we could be in the same tent together. We could have a laugh and all that. And I was like, mate, I'd love to. Oh yeah, I'll do it with you. Too right. And uh, so we were going to do the 2018 one together. Um, so I said, when I thought about it, I was like, oh, actually, mate, it's like nearly five grand to enter. I don't know if I've got... Is that what it is? Five Gs to enter, is it? About okay. That, yeah. You can get a discount, I think, for yeah. if you're like a charity or whatever, but it's about that, yeah. or it was. Yeah. Um, pretty spinny. And uh, he was like, hang on, mate. Put the phone down. <laughs> Phones me back later. And he goes, mate, it's all paid. Done. And I was like, what? And he was like, I've paid your slot. Your slot's paid for. It's all done. Just train now. I'm like, oh, okay. A couple of weeks later, we went down to Devon on holiday and I got a phone call that he killed himself. Like, depression, mate, yeah. Wow. Cut me deep, that one. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. I was a kicker. Yeah. Had a little kid and a wife. Depression, mate got him in the end so how did and he it t- turned how, out how did he take his own life hang himself mate that was the thing that i didn't realize mate right this is weird right so i knew you had depression i knew you had stuff going on uh real bad sorry mate and it's fine. he uh when he used to phone me he'd be stuff like dunk how 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 did you get around this mm-hmm. how, how do you get around i got I got diagnosed, mate, and maybe it's obvious, but I got diagnosed with depression and PTSD and all the rest of it. And I thought that, mate, I was like, I don't, I'm just not adjusting to this, yeah. whatever this is. And they hit you with pills and fucking advice and shit. And I'm like, and I had a good crack at suicide, mate, which I'm sort of embarrassed to admit, but it wasn't a cry for help go at it, mate. It was... If I'd succeeded me, it would have been a, you know, it would have been an incident like it would have been bad. And that was like a real bad 
point in my life and I knew what it felt like being there like making that decision where you feel that everyone is better without you and that's the weird thing yeah. about it you convince yourself that everyone is happier better my wife will get you know whatever insurance they, they'll be free and clear they'll be all right but she'll probably get another husband that you totally sell yourself mate and luckily whatever made me feel like that lessened and i, I was able to stop what i was doing what were you doing Two hand grenades, mate, came back in my kit from after. They never checked my kit. They never checked my kit. They just put all my operational kit into a box. Um, and I was clearing my box when we were moving house. And I found them. And I was like, fuck, what the fuck do you do with this? I also found uh, like a nine millimeter mag from a pistol that had up on here at a pouch. Absolutely caked in my blood and shit. All this fucking kit was in my box, mate. I'm like, who the fuck? Who checks this shit? Never thought. I j mate, I was I was on a lot of meds, right? So I probably should have told someone that it was there or they were there, but I never. I just didn't. And I thought, I'll deal with that some other time. And I had this incident, mate, where totally my fault, completely my fault. Um, being out, like, round the corner... And I had a couple of beers with a couple of lads I hadn't seen in a while. And my wife, we, the baby was upstairs sleeping. My wife, we, we were dog sitting the dog at a time. Uh, the, the mother and father-in-law's dog at a time. Little terrier, lovely wee dog, but yeah. yappy. Yeah. And uh, I came in later. There was no phone signal. My wife had been texting. So she's not annoyed, but she's like, obviously, where are you? Mm. I came in later than I said. As I come in, not realising, she put the baby to bed. Dog barks, baby wakes. She gets annoyed. I hit the roof, you know. I'm just not in a good place to be telling that I'm out of order, which I was, mm. totally in the wrong. I lose my shit. Uh, I had a bit of an episode where I just didn't know where I was, mate. I don't know the reasons why it got explained to me later on, but I just whatever. And I was like, right, I don't need to be here anymore. And I just told my wife, right, I'm going for a walk to calm down. I went down the road, I'm on my crutches, mate. And I managed to put these, I went in the garage, grabbed these hand grenades and went down the road. And there was a, a bit, like not far from where I lived. And it was part of the running route, actually. And it was all cross country, sort of like by the fields and that. And I got in this little copse. And I sat there, mate, with these two grenades, mate, and took the safeties off, took the pins off. It's pitch black. I just sat there. I was like, right, you fanny, just open your hands. Done. Just just open your hands now. It'll be over in a second. And I couldn't do it, mate. I couldn't do it. And I, you work yourself up to a point. And then suddenly, time is a healer. It starts to come out down. Yeah. I'm thinking, right, I'm not going to do it. Where the fuck did I put these pins back in the dark? I'm thinking, where the fuck? fuck. I was like, fuck! <laughs> like, everyone's going to think he meant to do it. It was an accident. <laughs> uh, uh, so I managed, to, wow. I managed to put the safety clips on. Yeah. Sort them out. Anyway. Next day, a mate of mine pulls up in a car, and I don't know how he knew. He was like, I don't know what you had. I don't know what it was. But give me them now. I was like, Okay, I gave him him. He goes, right, I'm going to get rid of these. And he got rid of them. And he was like, ever do that again. I won't. I just won't. And I, I hate sort of, I feel like a bit of a knob talking about it, mate. But at that point, I was like, right, I am never, ever doing anything like that again. It's not going to happen. Yeah. I need to stop being a twat, right? Stop drinking. Because you're taking meds. Yeah. So take absolute responsibility for your actions. I asked for help. Didn't get it. Mm. Didn't get any help, mate. And I was asking. I was asking for it. I was saying, like, please, like, I've done this, I've done that. Oh, shit. Who were you asking? When I was at Headley Court, um, one minute they'd be there, the next minute, posters, I'm going away. 
yeah. get another one in. Mate, just tell me what's going on. You're like, I've told the other guy. Yeah, what, okay. why? And it just, in the end, you're like, do you know what? Yeah. I'm going to sort myself out, which probably wasn't the right thing to do. But going back to my mate, the reason it cut me deep, mate, was knowing what he did and how he did it, to be in that place to do that, you know, his mate, I met his mum and dad at the funeral, saw his wife and child, I couldn't speak to them. I saw a, a guy there that I used to be on the SFSG with, actually, it was his brother-in-law that I didn't know. It, was, it just turned out. And uh, he said to me, he said, mate, he goes, do you know, he goes, he, uh, he phoned me that morning and he said, let's meet up for a, a brew or a bit of, bit of food. Mm. And he, he knew I was going to be the one to come and find them. And it's his was a bad. He was like, so, so I went, so then that was 2018. COVID hit. Did you go and find your mate? Who's that mate? The one who committed suicide? No. No, okay. No, 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 no. Okay. Sorry, no. So uh, the guy I spoke to at the funeral, he yeah, found him. He found him, okay. He found him. Okay. He told me what, what he'd sort of done in that and that. Do you know what's scary about this whole thing? Go on, mate. I've got three friends who have committed suicide, hanging themselves, but it's not reported anywhere. Yeah. Nothing's reported. Like know, male suicide know, is mate, huge, yeah. but nothing's ever reported. Mate, well. There's a website out there you, called Jack. Yeah. J A A Q dot org. Anyone yep. listening out there or watching this, if you're yep. not feeling in a good place, <clears throat> you think about committing suicide or you've got problems or da, just go onto jack.org. J A A Q. Just ask a question. Yeah. That's org. It. it gives you all the answers you need to know. It's all in film. It's not in black and white no, it's, writing. It's, it's all done that. like masterclass. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think if we went around this building yeah. to blokes, if I'm not making it a sex of thing. Yeah. And you said, don't suppose you know anyone that's committed suicide, mate. Yeah. You? I bet everyone. I hear you, yeah. More everyone. That, yeah. There's, there's guys that I worked with. Oh, mate, it's, it's double figures now, mm. right? What for you, double figures are doing? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And there's only so many times, right, you can go to a funeral yeah. f for a similar thing. Now, that sounds really selfish, right? Because it's not about you, but mm. I'd rather, right, someone just phone me up. Yeah, same. And says, mate, I'm I struggling. am hanging yeah. out. Yeah, hear you. I know you're probably busy, but any ch I'll tell you, mate, I'll be in the car, mate. Same. I'll be in the car. Just just tell me where you are and I'll just I'll why, come and find you. Why do blokes not speak up? Blokes are speaking up more now because of, you know, social media, everything's going out there. But why do you think... Is it a pride thing? Is it an embarrassment thing? Is it if you tell someone, they may tell someone else that he wanted to go and think about committing suicide? What do you reckon I don't it know is? Because I'll, I'll talk about it, not very often, but like I'll talk about it now. And the more I talk about it, mate, you'll speak to someone and like, yeah, uh, yeah, mate, I'm, I know what you're saying. Yeah. I actually felt a bit like that. And yeah. you're like, did you? And they're yeah. like, yeah. So by uh, speaking is helping. Yeah, yeah, but like it's hard to get the ball rolling, mate, isn't it? Yeah. It's just hard to get the ball rolling. And I don't think it's a, 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 a military thing. You know, you're saying you've got mm. mates that have done it. Mm. It's a bloke thing. Yeah. yeah. But I think a bloke would rather fall on his sword then, than say any chance, you know, yeah. they just won't I do. think blokes see it as a sign of weakness where it shouldn't be. Yeah, they do. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how I feel, mm. mate. I feel like a coward, mate, again. You know, so Duncan, for you moving forward today, what's your day to day like today? I just, mate, I, I gave I gave my job up in uh, February. I've just s struggled, so I I got out in 2012. Did what people would think is like great, loads yeah. of expeditions and yeah. stuff, and it's exciting and it's great. But I suppose in one aspect, mate, I was burying my head in the sand. Mm. I wasn't getting a job. I wasn't doing something. Uh, and I decided in COVID I need to get a job and I, I got a job and I've tried loads of different jobs and I just find, I, it's, I don't know if it's imposter syndrome, mate, or whatever it is. I just, I just can't settle, yeah. mate, in a job. I just always feel like I'm shit. Like 
I'm not doing the right thing or I'm not good enough or I'm not doing this or that. And it's not a poor you, like, yeah. oh, I feel bad for you. It's just mm. for the money that I'm being paid a wage, yeah. I, I want to know that I'm earning it yeah. and I just never feel that I'm good enough to do that, you yeah. know? And it got to the point in the in, in the last job I was doing that, I was like, I, I need to leave, I need to go. I can't just feel like a burden all the time. Mm. And it's it's my problem, mate. It's one of them things I need to sort out, but... How is it? Know. How is it for you when you see walking past, say, walking on a street, or you're walking somewhere? You clock. You must clock people clocking that you've got prosthetics on. Yeah, yeah. Is it like people? I think would get scared to ask. Like when I see people in the gym or ex-military, I was asked, "How did you know? How did that yeah, happen?" Yeah, what happened, like, yeah. are you more open for people to come and have a chat? You say, "What? What happened?" Because a lot of people would be scared to come and ask. Mate, do you know what? It's almost like. Uh, I thought, do, you, do you ride motorbikes or anything? No. No, right. So, like, I'm mad on motorbikes, yeah. right? I love bikes. It's almost like if someone came up to you and said, hey, can you just, what, what bike's that, mate? Yeah, okay. I'm I'm a bit of a prosthetics pervert, mate. Yeah. Right? I, I like, I like. <laughs> PP. Yeah. That's what it is. It's a new thing, <laughs> new right? Thing, yeah. it's, it's my only fans account, mate, right? <laughs> Look me up. And they, uh, I love it, right? Yeah. The carbon fiber, the titanium, yeah. the... You know, what variant is that foot? What is it? Mm. You know, what? so I have never, ever known any amputee to not like someone asking them. Okay, that's nice to hear. I've had people say things to me before, mate, just like, wow. Go on, but, go on. Me, I, I had a guy come, I did, I, so I've done uh, like, you know, like talks and stuff mm. for, for sort of businesses yeah, and yeah, bits yeah. of bobs, right? Yeah. And yeah. uh, this guy came at me this one time. You obviously didn't feel comfortable uh, asking um, in the crowd, which I'm glad. Mm. But he was like, uh, I, mean, I watched the film once and uh, this guy got blown up and he got someone to check that his balls were still there. I was like, where's this going, mate? <laughs> and, and he was like, I'm like, you better not ask me like if you can check my... And he was like, no, no, no. I'm just saying, like, did, did you have to get any of your mates to check when you got blown up that your yeah. balls... And I was like, no. Are you mad? I was like, are we talking about? I was like, no. I was like, no, they were definitely still there, mate. It was fine. And he was like, I always wanted to ask someone that, you know? And I was like, okay, mate, I'll see you later on, buddy. See you later. And, and it, mate, uh, I used to do talks for the um, uh, for the charity Walk and Wounded, right? Mm. And the first one I ever did, um, it was a primary school. And, like, kids are innocent, right? Great. Just say what they see, yeah. don't they? Yeah. And uh, this one kid, mate, I did this. It was only a small primary school. And we were doing, I was doing a talk on the South Pole, what we were doing, a little bit about me. And then we were doing a sponsored walk, right, about a mile. They all bring in a pound and mm. end it, right? And uh, I was like, does anyone want to ask any questions? And this little kid up the back was like, I'm like, go on, mate, what's the question, buddy? He goes, how many Germans did you kill during the war? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? Genius. What how would you think I am, mate? <laughs> and he was like, and I was like, none. It wasn't that war. And he was like, proper. He was gutted. Yeah. He was like, oh, all right. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then he came and saw me earlier on, uh, or later on, we were doing the walk. And he was like, he was only a little. And he was like, uh, can I hold your hand for a bit? And I was like, yeah, mate, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was all right. Yeah. Walking along. And he goes, uh, can I ask you about your legs? I was like, yeah, of course you can, mate. What do you want to know? And I was talking in the school about the carbon yeah. and why the carbon and tough. And all the rest of it, right? And I was like, they're really tough. And he goes, if I shot you in your legs, I'm in great yarm with me, so you could have been packing, right? So I was like, <laughs> go on. And he goes, if I shot you in your legs, would you die? I was like, uh, I was like, hang on, hang on. Do you, do you mean, are the, is this bulletproof? Is that what you mean? Yeah. And he was like, yeah. I went, no, no. I goes, oh, no, they're not bulletproof, mate. No, I go, so I suppose I wouldn't die, mate, but they're not bulletproof. He was like, why, why haven't you gone back out to Afghan then? I was like, what? And he was like, well, if you can't die, why don't you just go back out there? And I was like, all right, mate. <laughs> Done a bit. I was like, calm down. And then uh, he was like, all right, just asking, just asking. And then we got to the yacht's, yacht place at, where we finished. And his dad was there. And his dad was like, sort of stood there chatting to him. And uh, he's like, uh, mate, he didn't ask any weird questions, did he? And I was like, nah, mate. No, 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 not at all. He was like, oh, thank God. Yeah, God. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's all right then. I was, he asked me if I killed some Germans. He went, you know he didn't. I was like, you did. He went, oh my God, I'm so sorry. He watches the History Channel. I was like, all oh, right, okay. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Good lad. Dunk, I have absolutely loved this episode. Hey, cheers, mate. Thanks. Thanks. Mate, you're thanks a really me. humble human being with a massive heart. You know that? Nah, mate. Uh, thanks for having me. Like, Because I, 
I am a I watched this mate and I didn't really think I was the caliber to come on mate so thanks for yeah. having me mate, mate it's my Cheers. pleasure thanks. mate yeah you're a wonderful human being uh, yeah. Yeah. thanks and a massive shout out to your wife and yeah and it's your, good egg, your, yeah, yeah good egg, good egg. Yeah. to stick by you <laughs> yeah. and be that support yeah mate. and we your all, daughter we all need a kim mate yeah we all need a kim we do mate don't it. you're a legend mate Cheers, sir thanks. you're a legend thank you very much good man cheers buddy cheers thank mate you, mate cheers